Okay, good afternoon. We have some very exciting lectures today. The first is John Schiller. He got his PhD from the University of Washington at Seattle. And then he sort of came to NCI, worked his way up through the ranks. Uh, he became a postdoctoral fellow in 83, senior staff fellow in 86, senior investigator in 92, and he's a section chief. The title of his talk, Vaccines to Prevent Oncologic HPV Infection. John. Thank you, Gary. Well, thank, thank you all here for attending. It's actually very hard to give a lecture if there's not actually somebody here. And, uh, oh, that's right. I turn that on. There we go. Okay, now we're cool. So thank, thank all of you in the audience for, for being physical presence here and not, not just being through um, the, the video land because it's really hard to give a lecture when there's, there's nobody actually sitting in front of you. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. Those of you in video land, land, if you have any questions, my telephone number, my cell phone number is, no, I'm not gonna do that. So um, what I'm gonna tell, tell you about today is give you a, a relatively brief overview of the association of HPV and cancer, um, both epidemiologically and biologically, and then spend some time on something that, that I've been studying quite a bit, and that's the development of prophylactic vaccines, tell you why they work, tell you some of the history of, of, of that, and then go into some of the implementation issues where this is an issue where now we have something that we think is a very good intervention to prevent um, a series of, of important cancers, and how do you get people to use it? Because I think as many of you may, may realize that preventive measures are much different than therapeutic measures. You probably heard a lot more about therapies where someone has a disease, someone has cancer, they're very motivated to be treated. It's not necessarily the case for prevention where the people don't necessarily know who, who's gonna benefit and who isn't. So, infectious agents are the cause of many cancers. Um, it's been estimated that approximately 16% of all human cancers can be attributable to infectious agents. And the big three are really listed here, Helopactyl pylori, which is a bacteria, human papillomavirus, which will be the subject of today's talk, and then hepatitis B and C, um, all of which cause over half, half a million um, cancers every year. Now, important thing that uh, an aspect of each of the cancers that are associated with infectious diseases that I'll be bringing up at the end, is that most of infectious associated cancers occur in the less developed world. This is certainly true of HPV, where you can see the number of cases um, in the less developed world more in comparison to the more developed countries. Now, when we think about HPV associated cancers worldwide, we really focus on cervical cancer because it's both got the, the highest number of actual cases and also the highest attributable proportion um, where virtually 100% of cervical cancers are initiated by HPV infection. But it also causes these other cancers as well. Overall, HPVs are thought to cause 5% of all cancers in the world. Now, in terms of, there's a whole lot of different types of, of HPVs. There's over 100 different types of HPVs. But fortunately, when we start thinking about vaccine, two types predominate in cancer. And this is type 16 and type 18. And this is true in any parts of the world you look at. Now the types that are three, four, five, and six tend to vary a little bit. They tend to be the same sort of cluster, but the rank order changes a bit as you can see here. But suffice it to say that, that 16 and 18 cause about 70% of all cervical cancer. Now if you look at countries like the United States, cervical cancer doesn't dominate the HPV spectrum of cancers quite as much as it does worldwide. And there's two reasons for this primarily. First of all, pap screening has reduced the incident of cervical cancer by greater than 80%. So we're way down in the number of cervical cancers we would otherwise have without pap screening. And the other thing is that there's been in, in what's been called an epidemic of HPV positive oral pharyngeal cancers in the last couple of decades where they've increased more than twofold. And so for this reason, Oral pharyngeal cancer makes up a substantial contribution to the HPV associated cancers in the United States. It's actually predicted within 20 years to be more HPV associated oral pharyngeal cancers than cervical cancers. 
And the other thing that this causes is that it, it means that, that male associated cancers make up a larger minority than they do worldwide because, because oral pharyngeal cancers are actually more common in males than they are in females. Now the types of, of HPVs that cause cervical and other types of cancers kind of cluster in one phylogenetic group over here. Whereas uh, we'll talk a little bit about another group that cause genital warts, which are phylogenetically distinct and, and very distinct from the types that cause common hand and foot warts or a whole other group that may mainly cause asymptomatic infections in, in all of us. Now HPVs have a very peculiar lifestyle that's going to be related to vaccine development. And they're the only virus, or they're a virus that, that only replicates in squamous epithelium. If it would infect any other type of tissue, it wouldn't be able to produce virus. And in fact, it doesn't infect other types of tissues. Um, and, and the reason probably for doing this is that it allows it to evade the immune evasion. So what happens is that we think that the virus has to get onto the basement membrane to start infection. Um, and then, then it infects these basal epithelial cells with its very low level expression of what we call the early proteins, the proteins involved in autonomous replication, transcription, and ultimately what we call cellular transformation. Um, and then only as the cells become terminally differentiated do we get large amounts of protein expressed, particularly the virion proteins in over replication of the viral DNA and release of the, of the infectious virions. And so this area of the epithelium is not normally subject to strong immune surveillance because these are basically dying cells. And so this allows the virus to generally persist for quite a while before um, the immune system eventually recognizes and eliminates it. So basically, productive HPV infection involves hiding in plain sight. And this is actually an example of a high-risk HPV infection on um, the cervix, and you can see it's, it's very inapparent. It almost even doesn't even cause any hyperproliferation. And again, this is just an example of, of a marker of, of early gene expression, one of the oncogenes, E7. Um, and it's, it's actually, the, the E7 proteins made at very low levels, but because it, it degrades B15, I mean RB, you get uh, amplification of the signal and expression of MCF. And then the late genes, the ones associated with the virion, you can see, are just expressed in these upper layers of the epithelium. So the HPV has evolved to exploit the limited immunosurveillance of the upper layers of the skin and mucosal membranes. And we actually have a, have a very, a pretty good idea of how HPV is associated with cancer, at least on a gross level. So the very mild lesions that are diagnosed um, in a pap smear as low-grade squamous enteroepithelial or in histology as um, carcinoma in situ grade one, I mean um, cervical endoepithelial neoplasia grade one are really just virus producing lesions. And then as the virus causes dedifferentiation, there's no more virus production. So carcinogenic progression is as much a dead end for the virus as it is for the host. But you get oftentimes higher levels of E6 and E7 expression, often accompanied by viral integration. And this leads to a series of dysplastic changes from intermediate dysplasia to high grade dysplasia. And then when the entire epithelium um, is, is a proliferative compartment, it's called carcinoma in situ, and eventually leading to invasive cervical cancer. Now one of the questions is, is why does the virus encode oncogenes? I just told you that it makes no sense for the virus to cause oncogenic um, progression because, because the progressed lesions don't produce any virus. And basically it does it as, as a byproduct of overcoming a problem. Because as I, I told you, the virus replicates its DNA in terminally differentiated cells. Well, those cells are not themselves dividing. So it's got to figure out a way of tricking the cell into thinking it wants to divide to make the replication machinery that's needed to make its own genome. And so it's got one protein called E7 that tricks the cell into aberrant proliferation. But as many of you know, if you get unscheduled or, or abnormal signals for replication, this is a signal for the cell to undergo apoptosis. And so it's got another protein whose main function is to prevent apoptosis. So the combination of inducing aberrant proliferation and preventing apoptosis leads to immortalization and genomic instability 
and eventually to transformation in, in cancer. Now both E6 and E7 interact with a wide variety of proteins. It, it, it's remarkable that this is, E6 is 150 amino acid protein, E7 is 100 amino acid proteins, and all sorts of cellular partners that it interacts with have been defined. Neither one of them has enzymatic activity. And a bunch of them are listed here. And it's still kind of unclear which, which of these activities are important for carcinogenic progression and which are just important for its normal life cycle. But what is pretty clear that one of the interacting partners of E6 is important for carcinogenic progression, and that's an interaction with P53. It interacts with P53 um, through binding a protein called E6AP, which leads to ubiquitination of P53 and its degradation. And the same can be said of E7. So it interacts with a whole bunch of different proteins. But again, one of the important interactions is, is likely with RB and related proteins, P107 and P130, because changes in, in P53 and RB uh, um, by mutation are actually very common in cancers that aren't associated with HPV. But again, this interaction, as well as interactions with cyclins and, and inhibitors of cyclins, probably are involved in, in driving um, the proliferative cycle of these cells that are normally terminally differentiating. Another really interesting feature of, of HPV-associated carcinogenesis is that it almost invariably at the cervix occurs at a very particular site. So the female reproductive tract at the, at the cervical transformation zone um, goes from being a stratified squamous epithelial to a, a single layer simple columnar epithelial. And this is where the cancers arise. We're not in, entirely sure why they arise, this, arise here, but in a fairly recent um, paper, it was shown that in a very small portion, right at this transformation zone, there's a, a very small layer of cells that, re, that maintains a very embryological um, phenotype. It expresses a series of proteins, including keratin-7, that normally are expressed in fetal cervix, but aren't expressed on mature service, cervix. So we think that there's something about these cells that make them especially prone to cervical carcinogenesis. Whereas if you get an infection here, or you get an infection here, it's much less likely to undergo carcinogenic progression. And this transformation zone is important because some tissues at HPV, in fact, have this and other ones don't. As I just said, the, 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 um, there is a cervical transformation zone at the cervix. Um, and there's also a transformation zone at, in anal um, epithelium where most cancers arise. Now, HPV infections of the vulvar, vaginal, and penis are probably at least as, as, as common as cervical or anal infections, but they very seldom go on to cancer, and it's probably because they lack this transformation zone. So this is something that we still need to understand more fully, is, is mechanistically, why is it these, that these areas are the place where cancers arise? But just to note that here's an example of a high-grade lesion, a SIN3, and the fact that generally a high-grade precursor to, to develop cervical cancer takes at least 10 years. And so overall, schematically, this is the, the timeline for progression of a, of, a, of a lesion, an HPV primary infection, um, to cervical cancer. So infections are extremely common, but most of them most of them go away spontaneously. So the lifetime incidence of genital HPV infection is probably over 80% in the United States. So being sexually active is almost being, is synonymous with having an HPV infection. But as I mentioned, most of them go away spontaneously, which eliminates the, the, the risk of cervical cancer. It's not clear when we say they clear spontaneously, where they really go away entirely, or in some cases become latent. This is something else we don't fully understand. But it's suffice it to say the immune system keeps it under control, and so that now if you can't detect the virus, the chances of getting um, cervical cancer from that virus is extremely small. But so the, what's on the causal pathway to cancer is really persistent infection by specific types, the high-risk types, and as I mentioned, specifically 16 and 18. This is really by far the most um, important risk factor for progression to cancer. Precancer generally takes about a decade and then some of them um, go away, but then these precancerous lesions, as I mentioned, within about a decade, oftentimes advance to cancer. 
So, so cervical cancer is kind of unusual in that it actually affects relatively young women. So women in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, it's actually by their mid-30s to 40s that the peak is actually quite flat. And it's not, it's not predominantly um, a disease of older people like many cancers. So they're, they're not more common when you start to get into the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Again, it's probably due, due to the viral um, etiological etiology. So now I'm going to turn to uh, um, what we did to develop a vaccine against this virus. And I want to take you back to the time when we first started to develop this, this vaccine, which was the early um, 1990s. And at this time, what we knew is that if you took, if you did intramuscular injection of papillomavirus variants, and these were in animal models, we could actually isolate real variants, um, which incidentally does not lead to virus replication, because as I said, they only replicate in stratified squamous epithelium, that this could induce protection from experimental infection with animals. And you could actually take serum from, a, from a, an animal that was um, injected with these variants and transfer protection to serum. So we thought, well, hey, it's antibody mediated. But the problem was when we tried to mimic this with um, in vitro derived protein, for instance, denatured form of the major capsid protein, which is called L1, um, for instance, made in E. coli, or L1 peptides, synthetic peptides, or again, E. coli derived um, peptides, they didn't protect at all, okay? They didn't induce any neutralizing antibody. So this led us to believe that generated an immunogen with confirmationally correct L1 was the critical feature. But as I, as I mentioned, since the virus only replicates in stratified squamous epithelium, and you can't reproduce this in large scalable quantities, there was no source of authentic variants in which to make an inactive vaccine, for instance, as you might for measles. The other issue with an inactivated vaccine is that the vaccine would contain these viral oncogenes, and you'd never be able to use um, a vaccine that, that could potentially contain oncogenes in healthy young people, the vast majority of which were not destined to get cervical cancer. So what we did is we generated what was called virus-like particles, and we injected, or we, we introduced L1 um, into a baclovirus expression system. The reason we use baclovirus expression system in production in insect cells is it had already been approved for, for human clinical trials, at least other types of proteins that were generated in the system. And what we found is that these, this one protein alone, L1, the major capsid protein, spontaneously assembled into what we call virus-like particles, or VLPs. Um, and importantly is that when we injected these VLPs, they acted like real virus and induced very high titers of virion neutralizing antibodies. And this we first showed in, in an animal model. But because they didn't contain any of the, um, the early proteins, the E6s and E7s, they were non-infectious and also non-oncogenic. So this provided um, a potential source of a vaccine that we could then test in people. And I have to say, when we first tried to develop this, there was a lot of skepticism um, that a, a, a vaccine against sexually transmitted disease could work. We actually went around and talked to a whole bunch of different companies, and most of them said, oh, your data looks great. You have all these great neutralizing antibodies and everything in your in vitro system, but we just know sexually transmitted diseases don't work. Uh, sexually transmitted disease vaccines don't work. But two companies took a leap of faith that maybe this could work, um, GlaxoSmithKline and Merck, and they actually independently developed vaccines, which are similar in concept in that they're based upon virus-like particles, but are somewhat distinct. So Cervarix, which isn't used very much in the United States, is a bivalent vaccine that protects against 16 and 18, which I've said um, is a cause of about 70% of cervical cancer. And they actually make it in the same production system as we did um, these baclovirus infected insect cells. The Merck vaccine is quadrivalent, and it contains the same two high-risk types, but also 6 and 11, which are responsible for about 90% of, of genital warts, and it's made in yeast. Now, importantly, both vaccines are recommended for injection um, in three doses over a six-month schedule with some difference between one or two months in the, you know, the second dose. And this just shows you the timeline of, of developing this. So one thing that I want to leave you with is <laughs> if you want to develop um, public health interventions, you better be patient because it takes a long time. So this shows that um, in 1982, Harold Zerhausen and colleagues 
discovered HPV-16. He actually, in 2008, got the Nobel Prize for this discovery. It took us about 10 years to come up with the VLPs. And then by the time the vaccine got licensed, it was almost 15, year late, 15 years later. And this was with, with two companies, two of the best um, vaccine manufacturers in the world, competing with each other to bring this vaccine to market and to capture the market. And it still took 15 years. And because what we're preventing is initial infection, it's probably going to take us at least another decade before we see a significant drop in cervical cancer rates based upon this vaccine. So these types of interventions, especially based upon um, prophylaxis, the uh, prevention of cancers, takes a long time for, to, to see um, a benefit. Now, one of the things that's important to point out is, is is that it was absolutely critical to understand this process of how you go from virus infection to cancer in order for us to have this vaccine today. Because we could have never have this vaccine licensed with an endpoint of cervical cancer for two reasons. One, it would have taken decades and decades. You'd have to follow these women just about forever in order to show that you protect against cancer. And secondly, in a trial with active follow-up, we couldn't let anybody go on to cancer. So we had to do careful screening of these women by pap screening and also by measuring their, the DNA content of their cervix and so that we would identify pre-malignant lesions and have to, to remove them surgically before these women went on to cancer. It would just would not be ethical to allow them to get cancer. And so this is an example where the basic understanding of, of how the cancers progress from, from other lesions was important because for licensure for prevention of cervical cancer, we only had to show that it protected against development of this moderate and high-grade dysplasias by the 16 and 18, the two types that were targeted in the vaccine. Based upon that, the FDA says, okay, we, know, we believe that if you prevent that, that it will prevent cervical cancer. And so, there actually were a series of trials done, both by um, Merck and, and GSK, and also by the, the National Cancer Institute here, um, that looked at the efficacy of the vaccine. And what this shows is if you look at the most cancer proximal endpoint, SIN3, high-grade cervical dysplasia, that both vaccines gave 100% protection against disease caused by the vaccine-targeted types. So this was really remarkable. No one thought that this was, that an SCV vaccine could, could work at all, let, let alone work with 100% efficacy against the types that it's targeting. There was also very strong protection of Gardasil, which remember targeted the genital wart types against genital warts, over 95% effective. Against um, anal infections and genital warts in males, protection was looked to, appeared to be somewhat less. We think the main reason for this is because the vaccine prevents infection, but doesn't treat infections once they occur. And I think, in, in the idea is we probably miss more prevalent infection in, in men in the male genitalia than at the cervix. And so because of this, there was more men who had infections that we missed, and they emerged during the process of vaccination and looked like they were, they were incident infections, but really were prevalent before um, we vaccinated them. And so overall, um, in terms of clinical trials, if you look at has, and these are the different types of, of, of cancers that are associated with, with HPV, and you look at have we demonstrated protection from infection, or how about intraepithelial neoplasia? Um, it's true, we've done this for cervix, for anus, and for vulvar cancer. We haven't for penile cancer because penile intraepithelial lesion is extremely rare, and we just didn't see enough cases in the trials to show that we protected against lesions, although we did protect against infection. In the case of oral pharyngeal infection, there, there's some limited data that it protects against infection, but it turns out for oral pharyngeal, which, which most of the cancers actually occur in the tonsillar crypts, we actually haven't identified unequivocally the pre-malignant lesions. And so we have not, we haven't demonstrated, of course, that the vaccine can protect against those lesions. So this is against uh, a, a, an area that needs to be pursued more fully is to really understand the natural history of oral pharyngeal HPV infection and how it leads to cancer before we can do those studies. 
So just to, to, to indicate that the vaccine does a lot, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't prevent infection or disease caused by most of the other HPV types that cause about 30% of cervical cancer. And as I mentioned, it doesn't induce regression of, of established HPV infections or prevent progression of HPV-induced lesions. So it doesn't act therapeutically. It's a whole other subject is to try to develop therapeutic vaccines for this, for this virus. So I've mentioned that, that HPV-16 is targeted by both of the vaccine, which accounts for about 70% of cancers. Um, there's a new vaccine on the horizon, uh, which is called the nonavalent vaccine that Merck is, is developing. So in addition to 16 and 18, it contains the VLP types of the, the five um, next types that are associated with cancer. You can see that each one of these contributes relatively small amounts. And this vaccine could presumably go from protecting against 70% of the types that cause cancer to about 90% of the types. And they were able to show in an efficacy trial, in this efficacy trial, they couldn't use a placebo control because it would have been considered unethical. So they compared Gardasil, which protects against 16 and 18, from the nonavalent vaccine. And what they, they showed is that the immunogenicity of the two vaccines against 16 and 18 were the same. Because both of them protected, they couldn't show efficacy. But of the, of the new types that were being targeted, the next five types, in comparison to Gardasil, it presented, prevented 96% of SIN 2 3s um, by the five additional types. So based upon this, they, they applied for licensure um, to the FDA. And it's likely that this vaccine will be available, I would say, in the next six months, at, at, in a year at the outside. Now, Merck hasn't been, been um, popularizing this very much because they don't want to stop sales of the current vaccine and have people wait for the next vaccine. Um, but it's likely within a year, this new vaccine would, will come out. So if you've got a 12-year-old um, daughter or friend of, a friend who has a daughter, I would hold off for a few months to get the new vaccine. One of the interesting questions will be is, well, what will happen with people who got the old vaccine? Well, they want to get the new vaccine and will be recommended and all that. So it raises a lot of implementation issues. Now, we think the vaccine protects from initial infection, um, which, again, is surprising because a lot of prophylactic vaccines, for instance, hepatitis B vaccine, doesn't necessarily prevent the initial hepatitis B infection, but it prevents you from getting the disease. So it nips the, the infection in the blood. But we think that, that this vaccine um, is, has sterilizing immunity because most vaccinees never test positive for HPV infection even when you use various sensitive PCR measurements. So if you swab the cervix, you never see positivity um, by PCR. And as I mentioned before, breakthrough infections tend to appear early in the trials, which suggests that, that most are emergence of prevalent infection. So the first six months of the, or, or year is where you see most of the breakthrough infections. And after that, essentially no one's getting infection out to about eight or 10 years now. And so we really think that it's emergence of prevalence infection that we're measuring early on because the antibody response goes up and then drops. So we think that the antibodies are likely to be the immune mediators of protection because we generate high titers of antibodies because cross protection in the clinical trials mirrors the antibody mediated cross neutralization. And importantly, in the animal models, we can transfer protection passively by taking serum from a vaccinated animal and putting it in a naive animal, challenging the naive animal that now has the antibodies in that animal will be, be completely protected. Uh, the other point is that cell-mediated effectors generally function only after infection has occurred and we're getting sterilizing immunity. So we think that, that the, um, the neutralizing antibodies are recognizing multiple distinct epitopes that are on the surface of the virus that vary a little bit from type to type. And probably this type speciation of the virus has occurred in response to neutralizing antibodies. But, but this speciation has occurred over millennia and probably will not occur in the short term because generally we think that multiple epitopes on, on the virion are recognized um, by the, on the VLPs. And so that if you would just get rid of, for instance, the, the DE loop here, you'd still have antibodies against the, the HI loop and so that you would, you would prevent infection that way. So we think it's unlikely that the virus will rapidly evolve to escape um, virion neutralization. The other issue is that this is a DNA virus, and you think about things like HIV, 
It's completely different. These viruses evolve about as rapidly as our own DNA because it uses our, the, our, our cellular DNA machinery to replicate themselves. And the antibody responses is really stunning. So basically everybody responds well to this vaccine. It's almost a rounding error. The very few people who don't make a good response to this vaccine. And the, and the response starts very high and then drops about a log as your short-lived plasma cells die off. And then you're left with your long-lived plasma cells in the bone marrow that basically continue pumping out antibodies for as long as we've been able to measure, which is out about eight or 10 years. So between year two and year eight or 10, there's no difference in antibody responses. And we think that this is just gonna continue out long-term. So we don't really know the duration of a protection. And clearly right now we're vaccinating 11, 12 year old um, girls and now more and more boys. And so we need this vaccine to last for a long time. Um, and some people criticize the vaccine. Well, how do you know it's gonna last long-term? Well, so far, since the antibody titers haven't changed between year two and year 10, there's no reason to think they're just gonna to start to fall off the table at this point. And so we're actually very optimistic that this is gonna um, induce long-term protection, at least through the, the years um, of greatest risk when, when people tend to change sexual partners the most. And just to show you how great this vaccine is, is, is inducing antibody responses, is some new data that we recently generated from the, this Costa Rican cohort, uh, the NCI trial, where we did a post hoc analysis and we looked at, th there, was, there was a certain number of women who only got one dose for various reasons. And they weren't randomized to get one dose, but some of them got only one dose. And the amazing thing, there's never been a subunit vaccine that's worked after one dose, okay? All subunit vaccines, non, you know, live replicating vaccines are given in multiple doses. What we found is after one dose, um, that by six months, the antibody titers had stabilized. And now this shows out to four years, we have unpublished data out to six years that there's no change in, in, in either the geometric mean titers, or if you look at individual women, no women change by more than, more than twofold, which is about the limit of the detection of our assay. Not only have the antibody titers um, stabilized, but all women remain zero positive at, at um, levels that are about ninefold over the levels um, from natural infection and less than fourfold difference than getting the three doses. So you get very little bang for your buck by giving the three doses. And the vaccine efficacy, at least as measured by um, persistent in HPV infection was 100%. None of the 150 women who got one dose has exhibited HPV 16 infection versus 15 in the controls. So this is actually quite robust data. You can look at the confidence intervals so that we actually think that this vaccine could be the first vaccine to work after a single dose, which would be revolutionary. And in terms of implementation, in the developing world could really make a huge difference. We really wanna go on and, and, and do a formal randomized trial where you compare one, two, and three doses and see um, what happens. Now, we think that the way these antibodies get there is by two mechanisms. So as I've said, we're doing intramuscular injection. And those of you who maybe know some immunology, systemic immunization is a really good way of generating IgG responses systemically, but it's a really lousy way of, of generating mucosal IgA. And IgA is the main protective antibody on many mucosal surfaces, for instance, the gut. But we really caught a break with HPV because at the cervix, about half the antibody is, is IgG. It's actually the same in, in the lower respiratory tract, although not the upper respiratory tract. And it's thought that, that, that this involves transudation of antibodies into the mucus by the, the neonatal FC receptor. Um, and we can actually, we can measure this antibody floating around in, in the, the mucus, but it's at levels that are about um, 10 to 100 fold lower than what's in the serum. But we actually have been studying the infectious process and it looks like in order to start infection, the virus has to bind to this basement membrane before it can be transferred to the cells. And so this, this allows for exudation of interstitial and capillary um, antibodies at these sites of microtrauma. And so the virus is basically trying to infect against a gradient of, of antibodies that are oozing out into that microtrauma, into that wound. And so the, the, the concentration of antibody near the site of infection may actually be quite close to what it is in the serum, which is very high. 
this got screwed up a little bit from the, the Mac to um, PC conversion. But so to conclude about the HPV VLP efficacy, the vaccines are highly effective at protection against the spectrum of anogenital endpoints from incident infection to high-grade precancer. And Gardasil is also highly protective against genital warts in both men and women. But type protection is type restricted, which is consistent with protection being antibody mediated. And as I mentioned, the duration of protection is unknown, but strong protection of eight or now even 10 years um, after antibody levels have stabled makes us very encouraging that it's gonna last long term. So we really think that, that these vaccines have great potential to prevent the half a million or more or 600,000 cancers every year that are associated with HPV. But they only have this potential if they're used. And this brings up, oh, oh okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. So just to point out that HPV vaccines are now licensed, are now very established products. Uh, they've, oh, more than 100 million doses of Gardasil have been delivered, more than 25 million of Cervarex. Um, starting in 2006, where they were licensed for prevention of cervical cancer and genital warts in women, um, Cervarex was about a year later, several years later in the United States. And then FDA approved um, Gardasil for genital warts in 2009 and anal cancer for both sexes in 2010. And the vaccines are licensed in many countries around the world, but there's a big difference between licensing a vaccine and actual having it be incorporated into the national vaccine program and being made available to the majority of the people in that, in that country. In most countries, especially the emerging countries and developing countries and, and lower development countries, the vaccine is, is very grossly underutilized. Now, one of the, the things that's, that's happening fairly recently is that some countries are going to less than three-dose programs, particularly the two-dose vaccines given at zero and six months, as recently approved in the EU and several other countries. And this was based upon what we call immunobridging. And so what they were able to show is that if you give two doses at zero and six months in younger kids, so nine to 13-year-olds, you get a non-inferior antibody response giving three doses in 15 to 26 year old, which was the target of, of the vaccine trials. And this is something that's been shown for other vaccines that by the time you, you, you go through um, adolescence, you reach puberty, your immune response to vaccines has already started to decline. And so this has led to, to two dose schedules being implemented many places, not in the United States yet incidentally, although we, we, we think that we should be probably going to a two dose vaccine trial uh, implementation. So this leads to the implementation issues. And again, you know, for this to be utilized, we really have to address some of these implementation issues. And the first question is who to vaccinate. Um, and overall, since in most of the world, girls suffer the majority of the HPV associated cancers, we really wanna focus on vaccination of girls. And after that, there certainly is reason to vaccinate boys, both because they're the vectors that transmit it to girls, and because they're associated with a certain subset of HPV associated cancers. And then young women, you, you wanna vaccinate young women if you have the money because um, although by the time a woman reaches her mid twenties, there's a very good chance she may have already been exposed to these viruses and then it won't do it any good. There's a subset that won't have been exposed and so could still benefit. And then um, older men would be the last group because they're least likely to benefit. Now it's important that we vaccinate before the the onset of sexual activity. And the reason for that is pretty dramatically shown here. So this shows um, the time since first intercourse and the cumulative risk of getting HPV infections. I mean, you can see by one year, by, by four months, 20% have acquired an HPV infection of, of starting sexual activity. And by two years, it's almost 50%. And this is same whether you look in the US or you look in the UK. So to get the most bang for your buck, you really need to vaccinate before they become sexually active. Because once they have their infection, again, as I mentioned, the vaccine won't do anything to make it go away. And fairly recently, the CDC has, has gone with a recommendation that boys 11 to 12 should be routinely vaccinated. And before this, the, the vaccine recommendation was what was called permissive, which means you can do it if you want to do it, but it was basically telling insurance companies they didn't have to pay for it. This change was made because, as I'll show you in a minute, uptake rates um, were fairly low in girls. And this was about the time 
when they receive the, the, the indication for prevention of anal cancer, not only in girls, but also boys, it was pretty hard for them not to say we should be vaccinating um, for boys if, you, if they could prevent a specific cancer associated with, with, with men. So one of the issues is, is how do you deliver three intramuscular doses to early adolescents? There really are, are currently um, very few intervention programs that are really targeted at adolescents, and certainly not intervention programs that involve three visits within six months. And um, what's shown here is the uptake rate, the percentage of, in this case, young girl, or adolescent young girls um, in various countries. And what you can see here quite clearly is that schools, uh, countries with school-based vaccination, uptake rate is very good for both one and three doses. Whereas in countries like the United States and France, we really don't do a very good job. So in the United States, it's about 54% get one dose and only a third of girls get all three doses. Now we're starting to look at this 50% one dose a little bit different than some people. A lot of administrators are looking at one dose as a failure. And given what we're seeing in Costa Rica, I'm starting to look at it as, as, as a positive thing. And overall, um, the incidence of HPV 16 and 18 infection in the United States has dropped about 50% in this age group, the age group that's targeted for vaccination in the next few years. And so people are thinking, well, there's some herd immunity because only 33% got full vaccination. But I think it means that maybe even one dose gives you protection. If you look at the uptake of, of the HPV vaccine, shown here in blue for females and in red for males, it, it's only started to uptick for boys um, when it became fully recommended by, by the CDC. But if you look at the uptake in women over a lar longer period of time, you can see that it lags behind that of two other vaccines, um, the diphtheria, uh, tetanus, acellular pertussis, and the meningococcal vaccines that are, that's basically administered to the same age group. And I think the main reason for this is that the vaccine is just not being as recommended as strongly by pediatrician and general practitioners as are these other vaccines. And there's certainly quite a bit of anecdotal evidence for this, that when a, a young girl come in, comes in to get these vaccines, the, the doctors say, it's time for you to get your DTaP vaccine. And then for the HPV vaccine, they say, well, this vaccine is available if you want it. And just that difference in messaging that they're giving it in large measures, I think, can account for the difference. There's also disincentive on, on, on certain parent parts because they think that it promotes sexual activity and things like that, which has been shown not to actually be the case. And it's really too bad that we're not using this vaccine more in the United States because in like Australia, where they do have 80% coverage rates, there's been a dramatic decrease in the population in intermediate and high-grade cervical dysplasias in the vaccinated um, age groups, even a little bit in this age group, but obviously not in the, in the older women who are not being vaccinated. So we're actually seeing some population effect for, from these vaccination programs. And because genital warts is an earlier manifestation of HPV infections than is high-grade dysplasia, you even see a much more dramatic effect. So the decrease in, in young girls in the youngest age group under 21, it's decreased by 92% since vaccination started in 2007, which is really amazing. And even in the next age group, it's decreased uh, by 73%. And perhaps even more remarkable is that among heterosexual men, which weren't being vaccinated up until about 2011, you can see that in the youngest age groups, who obviously are having sex with the girls that are being protected, you can see that, that there's been a drop of 82% in genital, war, genital warts among young men who weren't being vaccinated at all. So this is a really clear example of a very dramatic herd immunity effect. So one of the things we have to consider is the effect of vac the vaccine on cervical cancer screening recommendation compliance. So what I've said, told you earlier is that cervical cancer screening has reduced cervical cancer rates by about 80%. And the last thing we want to do is use a vaccine that protects against 70% of cervical cancer types and abandon screening which is actually maybe doing better than the vaccine. And so we really have to convince um, people, women, to continue, up, continue with their screening because the vaccine won't help women with established lesions and because it's type restricted, 
and won't be expected to prevent at least 20 to 30 percent of cervical cancers. With the new vaccine, we'll be up to 90 percent, so we'll get a little bit better. Um, and this is really too bad because if you look at the, the cost of, of screening, it really accounts for most, most of the direct cost of intervention to prevent cervical cancer in the United States. So cervical screening accounts for about 82 percent of the total cost of, of cervical cancer prevention programs, much more than treatment of, of, of cancers. Um, and so that what we really want to go to is, is a screening program that makes more sense for vaccinated women in the long term. And basically what we hope to do is to shift to an HPV-based cervical cancer prevention strategy where we'll vaccinate young girls to, to drop this peak of high-risk HPV infection and then replace the pap smear, which is relatively insensitive. It doesn't have what's called a very good negative predictive value. So if you're negative but for pap smear, there's a, there's a reasonable chance that it missed your high-grade lesion and your chances of going on and getting cervical cancer in the next 10 years is substantial. Whereas HPV has much better negative predictable value. If, if you do a swab and you don't have HPV DNA, the chances of you getting cervical cancer in the next 10 years is really, really low. And so what we hope to do is replace this more sensitive test um, done infrequently for this test, which is done very often. And a combination of vaccination and DNA testing, um, it's, been, it's been estimated could be delivered as much less, much, be much more cost effective than doing pap screening multiple times throughout a woman's life. And lastly, delivery to economic disadvantaged women. As I mentioned, about 85% of, of cervical cancers occur in developing countries. And there's really, um, dealing with this issue has really got to be multi-pronged. Uh, both companies have committed to, to sale to Gavi at less than $5 a dose. So Gavi is an institution that buys up a lot of vaccines and then delivers it to um, the 72 poorest countries in the world. But even at $5 a dose, this is more than all of the EPI vaccines combined in terms of price. And so one of the solutions I think is vaccine manufacturer in emerging countries. And we're working with country uh, manufacturers in, for instance, India and China and Brazil to try to produce this vaccine at a lower cost. This is essentially what's occurred um, for the hepatitis B vaccine, when, which when it was first introduced was somewhere up around $75 to $100 a dose. And now it's made in India for UNICEF for 18 cents a dose. So this is really what we want to do, but we want to shorten the timeline in which it gets produced in emerging countries. Clearly delivery of few doses will save money. And we're definitely on, on, on the path to delivering two doses. And I think ultimately, based upon the data I showed you, that, that the future of this vaccine is one dose. And lastly, something I'm not going to spend any time talking about is we're trying to develop second generation vaccines that could be manufactured and delivery at lower cost. It's so like one of the ideas is to make a recombinant measles vaccine because most kids get measles vaccine anyway and have it make the HPV VLPs so that you get measles protection and HPV for nothing. So on the horizon, there's, as I mentioned, the, the Merck Nonovalent vaccine um, should be uh, recently available. We're working on vaccines based upon the other variant protein, L2, which we think might give um, broader cross protection from a mono monovalent vaccine. And we really look forward to, to manufacture in emerging countries. And then the other area that I'm not going to talk about, but there's a lot of uh, interest in, is to develop therapeutic vaccines to treat persistent infection and pre malignant intraepithelial neoplasia. And, and we're making some progress in that, but I have to say there's there's not been any vaccine that's been in, in the phase three trial and been successful. So finally, in my last slide, what about vaccines against other microbial caused cancers? So helopactor pylori, there's no vaccine for, but this can be relatively easily treated by a series of antibiotics. And this, this bacteria infects the, the lining of the, of the stomach and it's very hard to get the antibody or, or, or cell mediated responses um, to that site. And so there's really no vaccine on the horizon. You've, I've just told you all about the HPV vaccine. The hepatitis B vaccine, there is an already approved vaccine. Now, hopefully a lot of you have already had that vaccine. There's no vaccine for hepatitis C. This is a rapidly evolving virus, much like HIV. And there really isn't really, I would say, a promising candidate on the horizon, although people tend to work on it. But the big thing is that fairly recently, virologic-specific antivirals have come about that are going to revolutionize treatment of, of HCV. 
They're really expensive right now, but eventually, hopefully, the prices will lower, and we'll basically be able to treat HPV persistent, HCV persistent infection, and it will make it much less important to develop a vaccine. EBV, there's people trying to work on this vaccine um, because it causes uh, lymphoma and asopharyngeal papilloma. But the first indication of this vaccine will probably be infectious mononucleosis, trying to prevent the, the you know, the symptoms of, of mono rather than directly waiting for, for prevent cancer. Um, Kappa C sarcoma, there really is not much interest in this vaccine, in part because it, uh, it, most of the cases, at least in the developed world, are caused by HIV infection, they're associated with HIV infection. But when you use heart, which you know the people are now on heart um, therapy, and that's pretty much eliminating uh, Kappa C sarcoma as well. So it's really being indirectly treated by HIV drugs. And these other cancers, there's just not enough cases where, they, and they're also mostly in the developing world, so there really is no uh, big interest in developing vaccines for them. So finally, I'd like to um, acknowledge my collaborators who have been doing some of the work I've, I've described, um, especially Doug Lowy, who's my co-PI through, through all the work that we've done, and then collaborators um, in DCEG who did the, the, the especially uh, who were in charge of the, uh, the, the NCI-sponsored clinical trial down in Costa Rica. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Yeah. Well, they're not, they're not more susceptible to infection. They're more susceptible to carcinogenic progression, okay? We've actually, in animal models, we, we've actually looked at this to see whether they're more susceptible to infection, and they're really not, okay? And like I say, the infection occur, can occur through the entire um, female reproductive tract, uh, but it's really that if you do get infection there, they're more susceptible to progression. And we don't understand why that is. It's a very interesting thing. We think, you know, just sort of very broadly, the fact that it's more embryological, uh, they're, they're less differentiated kind of cells. They're almost like more stem cell-like. And so that uh, we, we think that that may be why, but that's just sort of hand-waving. It's not mechanistic. Yeah, so there's a little bit of controversy. So, so the durability is the same, but you, you read some in the literature that it's not as good for 18 for Gardasil, the Merck vaccine. And part of the reason for that is because it's a little bit technical, but the assay they use only measures a subset of the antibodies that could be protective. And they happen to measure a subset that isn't the dominant subset in a lot of women. So that, that subset goes away, but they probably have other ones that are, that are stable. So there's a little controversy in the literature. And of course, GSK wants to make a big deal of this and say, yeah, the, the, the protection against 18 is dropping. But if you actually look for protection, there's no sign that, that Gardasil isn't protective long-term against 18. So that's a good question. Well, I mean, two answers. One answer is that, so the question is, you know, will we get type replacement that one of the other types will replace it? First of all, the other types aren't as oncogenic. So given infection, even persistent infection, the chances of going on to cancer are much less for the other types. So you'll be replacing it by a less oncogenic type. Um, the other point is, is, is there's no evidence that the types interact. So if you look at the natural history, multiple infections are very common. But the chances of, of one type being acquired or going away doesn't seem like it's influenced whether you have the, uh, another type or two other types or three other types. They all seem to be independent players at the cervix. And the other thing is, is now with the, with the um, impending nonavalent vaccine, I mean, now you're talking about the first seven HPV types that are associated with cancers. Now you have nothing but something that's caused a couple percent. And so I think that that, that problem really is never going to be a, going to rise. Okay. 
Thank you, Andrews. Okay, our next speaker is David Salomon. He got his PhD from State University of New York at Albany. And he was a fellow at the Roche Institute of Molecular Biology. He then came to NIH first as a staff fellow. And currently he's at NCI. He's in charge of the tumor growth factor section. His title is stem cells. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, Um, what I would like to do today is to give you sort of a conceptual overview of what cancer stem cells are. And really, it's defining a functional entity. And these are very dynamic cells that are in flux. They're very plastic. And they interact with their environment in very unique ways that's important for determining their function and their uh, mobility. And I think before talking about cancer cells, we have to understand what are normal stem cells, since cancer cells obviously arise, we think, from either stem cells or their immediate progeny, progenitor cells. And so uh, you can see that there's a good deal of interest in the lay population in stem cells because of their potential use in treating um, diseases for regenerative medicine, and, and obviously on, in cancer itself. Now, there are multiple sources of normal stem cells in the body, uh, the bone marrow being the primary source in our body. And those uh, stem cells have been used to treat various blood diseases, cancer, and MS. But there are other sources of stem cells in the cord blood, for example, excuse me, uh, stem cells exist and They've been used, again, in a setting to uh, treat various diseases uh, such as stroke and multiple sclerosis and or at least have the potential for treating those diseases. There are IPS cells, which I'll talk about in a little later, which are generated from adult somatic tissue uh, cells, fully differentiated cells by genetic manipulation. And they have a great uh, a potential for use in, in regenerative medicine and obviously neural stem cells in the treatment of spinal cord injury and some uh, diseases of the brain like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's and, and diseases of this sort. So I think when we talk about cancer per se, we have to understand cancer is really the flip side of abnormal, is really the flip side of normal development. It's abnormal development. So it's the use of embryonic signaling pathways or genes in an abnormal context that the wrong time and at the wrong place. And so it's really a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So we really have to understand normal development and the pathways that control it and stem cells within the process of development before we can really hope to ever approach to treat cancer stem cells or at least know what they're doing. And some seminal observations were made many, many years ago by people like Beatrice Mintz and Barry Pierce. And that is that basically what they found was that oncogeny um, which is cancer partially re recapitulates ontogeny in an inappropriate temporal and spatial context. And this was observed in embryonal carcinomas, which are really the um, stem cells from germ cell tumors. And what they found was that in these tumors, you could get all of the differentiated cell types that you would normally see in the body, that these cells had the capacity to differentiate under normal conditions. In addition, if you took tumor cells, from somatic tissues, from adult cancers, and injected them into an appropriate environment like the mouse blastocyst, you could actually revert those tumor cells in this embryonic environment to become normal, which was astounding. So it said that the environment could reprogram the tumor cell. And that was an initial observation, you know, some 30 or 40 years ago. And then recently, the importance of the microenvironment or the niche um, uh, was made by Beatrice Mintz and Gil Smith, and they found that you could redirect or reprogram tumor cells by either exposing them to a normal embryonic cellular environment or by placing these tumor cells in adult tissue stem cell niches. So again, supporting the notion that the environment can redirect a cancer cell and a potential 
uh, stem cell. And finally, the flip side of that can occur. If you take, let's say, tumor cells in vitro, and you take the conditioned media from those cells, and you treat adult, adult tissue stem cells or IPS cells that are normal stem cells or genetically manipulated stem cells, these cells will acquire the properties of cancer stem cells or tumor initiating cells. So there's a very strong dialogue going on here between stem cells and their environment, which will come out in a few minutes. Now, normal stem cells in development exist during early embryogenesis in the epiblast uh, layer, uh, which is derived from the blastocyst. And the epiblast actually is the primitive cell that gives rise to all of the germ layers in the embryo. The ectoderm, which is derived from the neuroectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm, and all of these germ lines uh, give rise to all of the organ systems and tissues within our body. So if we can understand the signaling events and genetic events occurring in this process, we might be able to understand some of the aspects of signaling in cancer cells or cancer stem cells, which is a very early primitive stem cell. Now, one of the processes which is important in this uh, uh, bifurcation of a, of a very pluripotent cell, such as the epiblast, into these different uh, germ layer cells is a process called epithelial to mesenchymal transition, in which an epithelial cell becomes a mesenchymal-like cell. And that process occurs during the early stages of the formation of these germ layers. And reciprocally, a process called mesenchymal to epithelial transition, which is the reverse process where a mesenchymal cell can either differentiate it into an epithelial cell or an endoderm cell, occurs in the development of the organs from which these germ cell line or layers give rise. Now, embryonic stem cells are the most pluripotent of all normal stem cells, and they exist in the embryo, and people have been able to actually derive cell lines from a number of, of vertebrate species established either from the inner cell mass or the pre or the or the epiblast, which uh, is generated from the inner cell mass. And these cells in vitro will differentiate into all of the tissues of the body uh, under defined conditions. And people are starting to work out the signaling pathways that are important in, in potentially channeling these cells down to various uh, germ cells that, or progenitor cells that can give rise to some of these different types of uh, adult differentiated cells. And obviously this has a great potential for the treatment of diseases and uh, specific uh, 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 pathologies. And as just listed here, there's a whole slew of them. Now, embryonic stem cells uh, share a certain genetic program or transcriptome. And listed here is a, an analysis from 40 separate studies of human adult uh, embryonic stem cells that have defined common genes which are expressed in these early undifferentiated pluripotent stem cells. And I call your attention to three of these genes, that is OC3 and 4, NANOG, and SOX2, otherwise known as the Trinity. These three genes are the master pluripotent potential control genes that are involved in actually keeping these cells in an undifferentiated state that are pluripotent and that can self-renewal. Now these genes are highly complex with respect to how their expression is regulated. They all cross-regulate each other in a very complicated way. So there's co-cross-regulation of each of the genes, each one of the genes by the other two genes. And they themselves orchestrate or regulate in a positive manner a number of genes shown here which are involved in maintaining pluripotentiality. But they also suppress a number of genes that are involved in promoting differentiation. So these three genes are exquisitely important in embryonic stem cells, and, and it, I'll show you later how they're important in cancer stem cells. Now, these genes, along with KLA4 and MYC, are genes that have a number of from uh, target genes, as shown here by the number of promoters that contain binding sites for these various genes like NANOG, SOX2, and OC4. And I place KLF4 in here and MYC because these are two other genes which are, are important in 
uh, deriving or producing uh, induced pluripotential stem cells from fully adult differentiated cells. So you can see that there are multiple targets being regulated singularly by these genes. And just for an example, if we take OCT4 uh, out of this group, you can see the number of different pathways that are regulated, and I've highlighted here some of the major signaling pathways that are regulated by OCT4. The MAP kinase signaling pathway, 92 genes in that pathway are regulated by just OCT4 alone. There's the JAK STAT pathway, there's the WINT signaling pathway and the TGF beta signaling pathway. And you can see the number of genes in each of those pathways, which is regulated by OC4, just singularly. Now, obviously, we have situations going on where these genes are regulated in a co occupied situation. That is, not only do you need one gene in this group, but you need at least one or two of the other members to uh, induce expression. And this is what's shown here that a number of these genes here, shown here, are genes that require both Nanog, SOX2, and OC4 to uh, induce their expression. And these are genes that are maintaining pluripotency in embryonic stem cells. And like I've shown you before, there are a number of genes involved in differentiation of the germ layer that are actually repressed by these genes in a coordinated fashion. And that coordinated repression is due to the ability of these three genes in concert to regulate the polycomb gene uh, complex, which is a repressor gene complex, which suppresses the expression of these differentiation genes. So there's a yin and yang going on here in these early embryonic stem cells. Now, there are multiple signaling pathways that regulate the expression of these trinity genes or pluripotency genes like NOC, uh, NANOG, OC4, and SOX2. And I'm, I'm not going to go through them. But some of them are directly controlling the expression of these genes, while others are indirectly controlling the expression of these genes. And I've shown here LIF, which activates STAT3. There's a uh, TGF beta related uh, series of, of uh, proteins active in a nodal. There's uh, the WINT beta catenin pathway, and there's the MAP kinase pathway. Some of these genes activate expression of these uh, pluripotency genes, like. Nanog, OC4, and SOX2, where others actually suppress expression of these genes and are involved in, in differentiation. So what about iPS cells? So iPS cells util, utilize some of the same genes that are important in maintaining embryonic stem cell pluripotency. And this is the, this is the Yamanaka factors that, or genes that, that he won a Nobel Prize for where he was able to demonstrate that you could reprogram somatic cells, in this case fibroblasts, to iPS cells by introducing OC4, SOX2, MYC, or KLF4. And obviously MYC is a dangerous gene because it's been implicated in, in, in oncogenesis. And recently NANOG and LIN28 have been shown to replace CMYC and KLF4. So there's combinatorial interactions and genes that can be used to reprogram adult tissue stem, a somatic cells to pluripotent stem cells. These cell genes in themselves regulate signaling pathways that are important in driving this process of converting a fibroblast to an iPS cell. And these three genes here actually suppress TGF beta signaling, which then is important in itself for regulating EMT. So you're blocking EMT. But there's another signaling pathway, the BMP4 pathway, which stimulates KLF4, which stimulates the mesenchymal to epithelial transition. And that's activated, and that's then able to take a, a mesenchymal-like adult cell and drive it back to a, a primitive embryonic epithelial-like cell. So you're shutting down EMT and promoting MET in this case. So you can see the importance of those two embryonic processes in generating iPS cells. And that will become important later. So what is the thesis of the cancer stem cell uh, hypothesis? And it's, it was, it was a, a way of explaining the heterogeneity that exists in cancers. And I'm going to be talking about exclusively about solid tumors here, not hypoquotic malignancies. It's a whole different story, but it has the same basic tenets. First of all, there's two ways you can generate uh, cancer stem cells. You can either generate it in a clonal fashion or a stochastic fashion 
by which tumor cells in, in the tumor itself all have the potential in a random fashion to become a cancer stem cell after transformation. And that cancer stem cell then can symmetrically divide and give rise to a clone. And that clone then becomes the seed for the tumor from which the other cells in the tumor are generated. Now, in 1988, John Dick showed in acute myelogenous leukemia that there's actually a subpopulation of cells which has characteristics of embryonic stem cells. And they were pluripotent, they're at a very rare frequency, and he called them cancer stem cells. Now these cells, he found, divided asymmetrically. That is, they retained a DNA strand, and the other strand was given to the daughter cell. So the one strand that was maintained in a symmetric fashion was passed along to the daughter cancer stem cell, where the other asymmetric strand was given to a cell which then was able to differentiate. So you had a, a, a cancer stem cell that already pre-exists within the natural environment of the tumor, but it exists in a very small subpopulation. Now this theory has been subsequently modified. These cancer stem cells are not fixed in the tumor from their, the tumor's inception. It turns out they can be derived from any one of those cells within the tumor. And th that's dictated by the niche in which those particular stem cells, or excuse me, tumor cells exist. So you can have a fully differentiated tumor cell or a progenitor cell reverting to a cancer stem cell given the appropriate environment or niche. Which, and, and in this case, the process is induced by EMT. It's a transdifferentiation process. It's taking a differentiated cancer cell and driving it back to a more primitive state. And this was a thesis that was actually raised and actually proven by Bob Weinberg at MIT. So it's really a hybrid thesis of, of the classical or stochastic model and uh, the uh, or excuse me, the classical stem cell model and, and the stochastic or clonal model. So it, it's an admixture of both of these models. So they're both right, it's just that they have a mixed uh, characteristic. And it's a much more dynamic process than either of these uh, models predicted. Now, what determines the frequency of a cancer stem cell population within any given tumor? And that's important. First of all, the cell, of origin from which the tumor arises will dictate, obviously, the number or frequency of the stem cells which might exist or be generated within that tumor. Is it derived from a pre-existing normal stem cell or a progenitor cell or a more differentiated cell? Genetic and epigenetic modifications of the tumor's cells themselves uh, will accumulate uh, alterations during tumor progression and dictate how many cells may have the potential to be cancer stem cells. There are contextual signals that the, the cancer stem cells in the in tumor environment or niche, microenvironment, are uh, sensing. And those signals are important in determining the frequency of cancer stem cells within any given tumor. What's the niche and the characteristics of the niche within any given tumor that's going to generate a potential stem cell population? And then the, another extremely important uh, factor when you're trying to identify stem cells is the immunological status of the host of the mouse, in this case, that you're looking at. If you have a genetically altered, a genetically altered mouse, the immune status of the mouse, if it's more immunocompromised, you're obviously going to get a greater potential for seeing more stem cells in that environment. So that's, these are confounding factors that have to be taken into account when you assess for stem cell activity in tumors. So what are properties shared by normal stem cells and cancer stem cells? First of all, they undergo asymmetric division and they self-renew. Uh, tissue stem cells, tissue-specific stem cells are capable of undergoing self-renewal throughout the life of the organism for obviously replacing those tissues uh, during uh, the aging process. Uh, to maintain at various points in the, in the adult uh, a differentiated population of, of cells. Cancer stem cells are tumor initiating cells. They, in fact, at limiting dilution, are the population that can give rise to tumors. They're the ones that have that potential, not the fully differentiated tumor cells. And so that 
it, it implies that they have an extremely uh, potent uh, capacity for tumor promotion. A second property of stem cells, both normal stem cells and cancer stem cells, is to differentiate into heterogeneous populations. Obviously, if you have a tumor that has a specific phenotype, to recapitulate that tumor, you have to have a stem cell that will differentiate and give rise to the same phenotype from the original tumor from which you've isolated those cells. And finally, the normal tissue stem cells and cancer stem cells are regulated by similar intrinsic genetic pathways. I've talked about three genes, NANOG, OC4, and SOX2, which are important in both contexts. And I'll show you later about the cancer context. And extrinsic signaling pathways. And those extrinsic signaling pathways either are generated from within the tumor cell itself, the cancer stem cell, or they can be signaling molecules generated by the surrounding niche. And what is the niche? It's an environment of the tumor. There are fibroblasts, there are mesenchymal stem cells, there are myeloid-like uh, cells, there's endothelial cells that all sit around the cancer stem cell and provide a cellular niche and they are all capable of producing activities or factors, cytokines or growth factors, which uh, are important in regulating the activity or function of those cancer stem cells. And that's shown here. So the normal niche and the abnormal niche may be two different environments. And the normal stem cell, obviously, if it undergoes mutations or transformation in some way through radiation exposure, can give rise to a potential cancer stem cell. But progenitor cells themselves can give rise to potential cancer stem cells. So it, you don't have to have a primitive stem cell giving rise to a cancer stem cell. Progenitor cells, their progeny may be able to do that. And in fact, fully differentiated tumor cells may undergo the process of EMT and generate intrinsic cancer stem cells. So the, it's a very dynamic process. So the, the cancer stem cell really is a chameleon. And it's there at a fleeting time, and it's trying to understand where those populations exist at any particular point in the tumor, and how can we target those populations within any, within any given tumor. And that's really a very uh, tricky business, and it's, it's, it's going to take a lot of work. And this just shows you some examples of that. You can have tumors generated from the the, the primitive stem cell within the tissue or more differentiated cells along this lineage pathway as the cells differentiate. Like in the hair follicle, you have the bulge cell and then you have the fully differentiated keratinocyte. You can have these cells all being targets of transformation giving rise to different types of tumors. So they all have the potential of giving rise to tumors and they all have the potential to be potential cancer stem cells. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a cell that's uh, in flux. And the same exists for breast cancer, and the same exists for hematopoietic malignancies. So it's a, it's a hierarchical lineage, uh, and each of these populations can be respective targets for transformation. Now, the cancer stem cell unto itself has some unique properties, which makes it a very nasty uh, cell. Uh, first of all, there's genomic instability. There's increased DNA repair. There's ABC transporters, which are upregulated. These are, uh, these are uh, uh, proteins involved in regulating the efflux of drugs from cancer cells. So those drug transporters are upregulated. These cells tend to be generally very resistant to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. They're prone uh, or derived from uh, EMT. Uh, they are basically quiescent in nature, so they're not rapidly dividing, so they're not really going to be targeted by conventional chemotherapy that goes after, you know, DNA replication. And they're resistant to apoptosis, okay? So DNA repair and, and DNA replication are two different animals, so I just want for your, just for your clarification. So there's a, there's a number of properties here that distinguish the cancer stem cell and the tumor from the other bulk tumor cells and that are uh, making them generally resistant to treatment. And so if we could target the cancer stem cell, we may be in a more, more favorable position to treat metastatic disease. Now, pathways involved in self-renewal are pathways normally involved in maintaining stem cells uh, in normal tissues. So these same pathways are deregulated in cancer cells. The wind signaling pathway, the 
hedgehog signaling pathway and the notch signaling pathway. And here's some types, some examples of tumors arising from aberrations in these three major signaling pathways, which are themselves embryonic signaling pathways uh, that are uh, due to perturbations in these pathways. Uh, Wnt being a, an example where those uh, uh, genes that are uh, misexpressed uh, give rise to a number of tumors in, like skin cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, colon cancer, and mammary cancer. So what about expression of some of these embryonic pluripotential genes in human tumors? So I've given you a list here of some of these types of tumors where OCT4, SOX2, KLF4, and MYC are expressed. And you can see there are a number of different types of human cancers where there's an overexpression of these pluripotentiality genes in those tumors. You can see that there's a, a good association between overexpression and high tumor grade and prognosis with respect to the expression of these embryonic pluripotential stem cell genes or NOS genes. Now, in human cancers, there's also an association of the targets for which those NOS genes, NANOG, OC4, and SOX2, regulate their target genes and aggressive tumors. And this was a study that was conducted by Bob Weinberg. And if you look at the embryonic stem cell module, this is a, by a transcriptome analysis, and you look at the target genes that are regulated by NANOG, OC4, and SOX2, you can see that they're uh, overexpressed in a number of different types of cancers. And it turns out, looking at breast cancer as an example, but it's also been seen in liver, lung, prostate, and gastric cancers, that those tumors that have an activated ESC-like module or trans transcriptome, that is target genes that are regulated by NANOG, OC4, and SOX2, generally those patients have a more a, a poor uh, survival uh, 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 potential, and they have a shorter metastasis-free survival interval. So it's, it, it, it's a signature pattern for more aggressive disease. And that was an, 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 a very seminal finding. Now, if we look at breast cancer, which is what I work on, and particularly some embryonic genes which are re-expressed in breast cancer, it's an important disease. It's affecting a number of women, either probably a quarter of a million Women are affected each year. There's approximately 40,000 deaths. The lifetime risk of breast cancer is in one, of the, one in eight women. Some risk factors are early menarche, that is the length of time that the woman is exposed to estrogen, okay? Nulli parity or late parity, that is the lack of a protective pregnancy, first pregnancy. And more interestingly, obesity. In premenopausal pre women, increases the risk of cancer by about 70%. Again, suggesting that there are environmental factors here that may be important, such as adipokines that are released by adipocytes. And finally, uh, the five to 10% of breast cancers are familial, and those cancers are in large part, but not all, due to mutations either in BRCA1 or BRCA2. So we're looking at anywhere of probably 90% of at least breast cancer being due to uh, somatic mutations or alterations in the environment, not mutations, or epigenetic alterations that will contribute to the etiology of that disease. So we have the human breast, and it is, consists of a series of ducts that are connected to the nipple, and the active component of the end of the ducts is a terminal ductal, ductal lobular alveolar unit that looks like this. Now the mouse has been used as a model to study breast cancer. Its gland is somewhat different. It has a ductal uh, pattern uh, of terminal end buds that uh, basically are at the end of these radiation radiating ducts that grow like a tree. It's an allometric fashion. During pregnancy, there's a hyperbranching of this duct-like or tree-like system. And then during lactation, you get development of alveolar structures where you get milk production. Now in breast cancer, human breast cancer, uh, it was originally histologically classified. And this is just some of the 
histological classifications of in situ carcinoma, that is non-invasive cancer versus invasive breast cancer. And you can see that there's a number of different histological subtypes that you can uh, uh, identify either in non-invasive or invasive breast cancer. So it says that this is a distinct set of multiple diseases or, or it's a cancer arising from multiple cell types. And that's probably true because we now have a system that was developed by Charles Perot where he was able to molecularly subcategorize human breast cancers based upon a transcriptome analysis. So there's clawed and low-like tumors, there's basal-like tumors, HER2 enriched tumors, and luminal A and luminal B tumors. And so the clawed and low and basal-like tumors basically arise from either primitive stem cells or bipotent progenitor cells. And these are the most aggressive types of tumors. Uh, these are more than likely triple negative tumors. They lack estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2. They are extremely refractory to chemotherapy and radiation therapy. They're extremely deadly. And they're more mesenchymal in appearance. Whereas the HER2 tumors and luminal tumors uh, are more epithelial. They have more differentiated characteristics. And in fact, they arise probably from more differentiated cells along this lineage pathway. And these are the more treatable tumors. So the less aggressive tumors are the, are the ones that are probably ER positive and PR positive. And these guys are the, the ones that are really the, the nasty ones that uh, uh, are virtually untreatable. I mean, in most, most cases, unless it's detected early. So the mouse mammary gland undergoes a series of cyclical events postnatally. And I've just described it before to you, but I just wanted to show you what this looked like in more detail where the virgin through hyperbranching develops these duct-like or tertiary and secondary ducts. And during pregnancy, these ducts develop lobular-like structures at the end. These are alveoli, as you can see here, and they start secreting milk proteins. And if you look at the stem cell population within the mouse now, this is in a virgin mouse mammary gland. The stem cell population basically exists at the growing end of these ducts. And this structure is called a terminal end bud, and it looks like a bud. And it's actually an admixture of different cell populations. There's a basal population around here, and there's a luminal population around here. Now, within the basal population, there is a subpopulation of potential uh, stem cells. And these cells are, are interacting in a very exquisite fashion with cells within the mammary gland that are not part of the duct, that don't give rise to the luminal epithelial cells or the myoepithelial cells, but there are fibroblasts and, and uh, lymphoid-like cells and macrophages and mast cells and, uh, that contribute to the maintenance of these stem cells within the primitive duct of the, of the virgin mouse mammary gland. Now you can measure stem cell activity. This is really a very beautiful system like they can in the, in, the, in the bone marrow by doing a reconstitution experiment. So in, in the case of the bone marrow, what you do is you irradiate the mice, you kill the bone marrow cells, and then you go in with a, a, a donor population of cells and see if you can actually reconstitute a functional bone marrow. You can do the same thing in the mammary gland, in the mouse. What you can do is take the gland uh, of a very young animal, three weeks old, and you can clear the fat pad. You can remove all of the epithelial cells from the fat pad surgically. And now you have, and you leave the, the actually, you de-epithelialize the fat pad and you just have the adipocytes and the stroma there. And so the niche is still intact, but you've removed all the intrinsic epithelial cells surgically. And now you can introduce by transplantation a recipient population. And those cells will actually reconstitute the mammary gland if they have the of potential stem cells or progenitor cells. So it's a way of assessing in a functional manner a stem cell activity in the mammary gland. And that's been very useful to identify uh, growth factors and genes which are involved in maintaining stem cell activity. And it turns out that the stem, the most primitive stem cell in the mammary gland, in the mouse at least, is a basal cell population. 
but it needs a supporting luminal cell population to maintain its, its potential activity as a stem cell. And the reason is that these luminal cells, which are generally a hormone receptor positive, respond to hormones by secreting a number of cytokines and growth factors which interact with the stem cell and maintain the stem cell in that undifferentiated state. So you can either perturb this population or this population and get abnormal mammary gland development. And this suggests that you can get cancer development by perturbing not only the target stem cell, but also maybe a supportive cell that's necessary. So you have potentially two targets here which might be interacting in a cooperative fashion. And, and you'll see how important that is in, in a few minutes. How do you measure stem cells in functional assays? This is for breast cancer, but it's basically true for all types of cancer. What you're usually using here are tissues or cell lines or mouse xenografts. And what you can use is various cell surface markers to isolate populations of cells that would be indicative of stem cells. So some of these markers have actually been characterized as marking putative stem cell populations. And by fax analysis, you can isolate and segregate these populations. And it turns out these populations of cells, uh, you can measure, measure functional activities in vitro and in vivo. In vitro, those cells that have stem cell activity will form tumor spheres uh, on non-adherent plastic in serum-free conditions. So they don't tip, stick, they grow under anchoesis. And actually, they exhibit self-renewal. If you dissociate those tumor spheres through one generation, you can pass them into a second and a third and a fourth. That's a property of a stem cell, self-renewal. So that's an in vitro assay. An in vivo assay, and more uh, stringent, is the ability of these stem cells to produce tumors upon transplantation under, and this is important, limiting dilution. That is, if it's truly a stem cell, very few are needed to give you a tumor. So you can go to very low dilutions if it's truly a stem cell or a progenitor cell and recapitulate the original tumor from which you isolated those stem cells. And that's basically uh, 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 the, the most stringent assay for defining at least stem cell activity. Now, in the case of the breast, either human or mouse, there have been markers that have been used that can be used in the fax analysis to isolate stem cells or progenitor cells. And in the case of the human, you have a luminal restricted progenitor population and a bipotent progenitor population. This is the more primitive stem cell population, and this is the, anti or the, the progenitor population which is derived from this population. In the mouse, there's a, again, a luminal progenitor population and a more primitive mammary stem cell population uh, called, this is the luminal progenitors are called uh, colony forming centers and this is mouse, um, excuse me, mouse repopulating units. So each species has a distinct marker. In this case, EPCAM and CD49F, in this case, CD24 and CD49F. CD49, CD49F is alpha-6 in your interest. And actually, there are a number of markers which have been identified that can segregate mouse and human uh, mammary stem cells. And some of them are listed here. And some of these same markers have been shown to be useful in isolating breast cancer stem cells. In those stem cell populations, CD44 high, CD44, CD24 low. What Bob Weinberg, same group, found was that there was a high expression of these NOS target genes again in breast cancer. And this expression of this NOS or e embryonic stem cell signature was more prevalent in tumors that had a higher grade or more malignant. Okay? It was also more prevalent in tumors that were generally hormone receptor negative either ER negative or PR negative, okay? And so that was a very uh, interesting and uh, helpful, uh, you know, finding uh, with respect to associating aggressiveness with expression of some of these embryonic genes uh, in these stem cell populations and correlating them with uh, patient 
uh, or histological aspects of the tumor. And what about survival? If you look at survival, it turns out that the expression of these ES-related or NOS target genes in several studies have been shown to be a very poor indicator of survival in several studies. And again, in these studies, there's an association with ER negative tumors, large tumors, and generally the triple negative tumors, tumors of basal cell, basal-like uh, phenotypes. So again, those more mesenchymal-like tumors are the ones that are exhibiting these more embryonic or primitive stem cell-like properties. And they're higher in stem cell activity than the more differentiated tumors, the luminal tumors, the HER2-positive tumors. And if you look at survival and expression of the actual NOS genes themselves, not their targets, there's an association with overall survival. So if you look at OCK4 and NANOG expression, either singularly or collectively, double positive tumors, you can see either by themselves or together, there is a, a, a stratification into poor survival in those tumors that are expressing either OCK4 or NANOG alone or together. So not only are the target genes important, but it's also possible that the, the NOS genes themselves are expressed in breast tumors and, and, and correlates with poor survival and, more, and a more aggressive phenotype. And cancer stem cell markers have been used in a number of different types of tumors uh, to isolate uh, potential cancer stem cells. So there are a number of different cell surface markers, CD133, CD44. These are drug transporters, uh, aldehyde dehydrogenase, uh, which has been recently shown by uh, uh, Max Wisha has been used as a marker to isolate stem cells from a number of different types of tumors. So you can see here that we're starting to collect a panel or signature for various types of tumors by which we can use to isolate potential stem cell population. Now I've mentioned EMT and MET in the beginning when I was talking about normal embryonic development and how that's important in generating the various derivatives or germ layer cells, the uh, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And these processes are not only utilized in early embryonic development, but they're also used in cancer and various pathological conditions, such as wound healing and organ fibrosis. Now, EMT is taking an epithelial cell, which is basically a polarized cell that has a very distinct orientation, and that these cells adhere to each other through lateral junctions, either tight junctions or adherent junctions, they sit on a basement membrane, okay? And what happens is through the process of EMT, they become more mesenchymal. So in that process, you lose all of these epithelial uh, proteins that are involved in maintaining cell polarity, tight junctions, and cell adhesion, and you acquire uh, proteins which are involved in maintaining the mesenchymal phenotype, such as bimentin and enconherin and fibronectin and smooth muscle actin. And in fact, this EMT process is regulated by a number of transcriptional repressors, snail and slug and ZEB1 and ZEB2. These transcriptional repressors uh, tend to repress expression of these epithelial genes, and they induce, by acting as co-stimulators, expression of these mesenchymal genes. And these genes themselves are the target genes for a number of different signaling pathways. So the TGF beta signaling pathway, or the Wnt signaling pathway, or the NOT signaling pathway actually upregulate expression of a number of these repressor genes. So these Embryonic signaling pathways are themselves contributing to the expression of transcription factors that are acting as repressors of the epithelial phenotype and therefore drive EMT. And the reverse situation is also true. There are signaling pathways like the BMP pathway that uh, actually repress expression of the mesenchymal proteins and induce expressions of the epithelial proteins. So this is driving mesenchymal to epithelial transition. How is this important? Well, EMT is important for metastasis. If you're going to take an epithelial cell and you want it to transit 
let's say, and colonize another organ, how do you, how do, you do that? An epithelial cell is basically sessile. It has apical basal polarity, it's adhering to each other, it's in a fixed position. Mesenchymal cells, fibroblasts are more modal, and if you push them through EMT and you provide them with the right stimulus, they can enter the, the circulation or the lymphatics by entravization, and then they can go to an end organ and then through the process of MAT, revert back to an epithelial phenotype and colonize that organ. So this whole process of EMT and MET is a reversible process, is, an, is, an, is, a, is a process or processes that are important for both uh, taking a primary tumor and getting it to a point where it can entravisate and then migrate out and facilitate its colonization of an end organ. And then to, to, to survive in that end organ, it has to have an appropriate soil. And there has to be appropriate factors in the end organ to support the growth of those tumor cells. And some of those factors are factors like BMP4, which take those mesenchymal cells and convert them back into epithelial cells. So it's a very exquisitely controlled process, and it's trying to understand the factors that are involved in regulating this and this with respect to the metastatic process itself. Now, EMT not only is involved in metastasis and basically is a marker for an aggressive phenotype, generally mesenchymal-like cells in a tumor are generally more resistant to drugs, are more resistant to radiation therapy, they're more migratory, they're more invasive. And actually, these properties unto themselves suggest that they may be stem cells. And in fact, that observation was made by several laboratories. It turns out that if you drive an epithelial cell, whether it's a normal cell, or a cancer cell through EMT, they become more stem-like in, in their phenotype. And those, those cells then are more mesenchymal, and they have a more stem-like characteristic in the, in the sense that they're able to act as cancer stem cells if you're looking in the context of cancer or tissue stem cells. And that process of EMT is obviously highly controlled by factors that are secreted by the tumor cells themselves, but also the host environment or niche. And that's just shown here in an experimental setting. If you take cancer stem cells, this is from, a, from breast cancer, and if you overexpress now these embryonic genes like OC4 or NANOC, interestingly enough, what happens is that if you ex overexpress them, all of the mesenchymal-like genes, N-cadherin, mimentin, slug, which is one of the repressor transcription factors, and snail go up. Whereas the Epithelial-like genes, cytokeratin 18 and e-cadherin, go down. Reciprocally, if you knock those genes out, you can then re-epithelialize those tumor cells. So either overexpressing them will drive them into a more mesenchymal state, or if you take the tumor cell and knock them down, they become um, more epithelial in their characteristics. So it again suggests that these pluripotency genes are regulating cancer stem cells by their ability to regulate at least one process, which is an embryonic process, EMT. And breast, breast cancer development is a, is a pattern that uses embryonic genes at various stages, and it uses various growth factors and signaling pathways at various stages. So you have a normal breast you get a transforming event occurring, you get a hyperplasia, which in the case of human breast cancer is called atypical ductal hyperplasia. It's a very early event. Some of these lesions can develop into ductal carcinoma in situ, it's otherwise known as DCIS. This is non-invasive breast cancer. It's still an early lesion. Those lesions are encapsulated in a basement membrane, but once the basement membrane integrity is compromised, and once the cells become more mesenchymal and more invasive and modal, then that's where all hell breaks loose. These cells can then entravisate and then extravisate. And obviously there are a variety of host tissue factors at these various stages which contribute to this in the organ itself. And in breast cancer, the primary sites of metastasis are lung, brain, liver, and bone. And there are various trophic factors that are being identified 
in these various organs that actually maintain breast cancer cells. And that actually may actually facilitate homing of the breast cancer cells to these various organs. And that's shown here. So in the primary tumor, you have macrophages and uh, myeloid suppressor cells derived from the bone marrow that are secreting factors that are generating, and, and also fibroblasts themselves, the tissue associated, uh, uh, cancer associated fibroblasts or CAFs, which are secreting uh, factors that can take a tumor cell and make it more mesenchymal. Then it's more deadly. It has, the, it has the capacity to invade, to get into the lymphatics or the bloodstream, and then to extravasate out and, and colonize an end organ, in this case, the lung. And in the lung, there are obviously are factors that are basically there, and they facilitate outgrowth of colonies of the breast cancer cells. In this case, the BMPs are secreted by lung cells, lung parenchyma, and you have, base, you have extracellular matrix proteins such as veraskin and tenacin, which are important in actually promoting adhesion of those tumor cells in the lung parenchyma. So these are factors being identified as potential targets. And in the parenchyma itself, there are lymphoid-like cells, myeloid-like cells, which are secreting factors that maintain or facilitate this MET, this transition back to a more epithelial phenotype. So how can we treat this disease? Well, most treatments to date have been by conventional chemotherapy or radiotherapy. See, so you're treating the bulk tumor population. You're giving a drug that's uh, you know, disrupting DNA proliferation, microtubule disrupting agents, things like this. But cancer, cell, cancer stem cells are basically quiescent, so they laugh at that. And they're not going to be killed by it. So you can kill off the bulk tumor cells that are differentiating, that are proliferating, but the quiescent cells are sitting there happily. They're not apoptosing. You're not disturbing them. So what we need are therapies that target those populations, the cancer stem cell populations. And if we treat them, we're going to be probably treating the metastasis population because these are the cells that give rise to the metastasis. So it's, it, it's a win-win it's, it's -win situation. So what are potential targets for cancer stem cell therapy? Well, I've, I've, I've alluded to some of them, the WINT signaling pathway, the NOTCH signaling pathway, and the hedgehog signaling pathway are all important pathways that are, in, are engaged for maintaining cancer stem cells. So if you target specific aspects of these signaling pathways, you may have uh, a therapeutic for knocking out cancer stem cells, and some of these drugs have actually been uh, taken to task in, in, a, in a clinical setting. And likewise, if you now use these sorts of drugs that target these signaling pathways that are maintaining cancer stem cells with conventional chemotherapy, now you're closing both doors. You're attacking the, the cancer stem cell population and the more differentiated population. So you hit them simultaneously. So that may be the wave of the future in this uh, scenario. Obviously, you can attack various components within the niche and signaling pathways, which are engaged by those niche components, the endothelial cells, the fibroblasts, the mesenchymal stem cells, and the macrophages. Some of these factors, which are secreted by these niche cells, may be appropriate targets because they're necessary to support the cancer stem cell. So here's another potential target or targets in the niche. So not only can you target the cancer stem cell, you should be looking at the appropriate host cells that are in the organ and or the metastasis for potential uh, targeting to do this. And in fact, drug companies have come up with a series of, of drugs here that can target signaling pathways that are important in maintaining cancer stem cells. They've also looked at the markers themselves as potential targets. Okay, and they're also looking at microenvironment factors secreted by those cells and drugs that can potentially attack those cytokines or lymphokines or antibodies against those. And finally, epigenetic therapy, trying to take the cancer stem cell and drive it to a more differentiated tumor cell, which is more attractively treated by conventional chemotherapy. So this is what we're left with. 
our present day oncologist. He's cutting the tree down. But in the process of cutting the tree down and the branches, he may be getting, get, giving, giving rise to a tumor of a more aggressive phenotype. And maybe what they should be doing is not only chopping the tree down, but going after the roots, the cancer stem cell, and the soil, the niche, which surrounds the roots. And I think that's the way cancer in the future will probably be attacked in a combinatorial fashion. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yes. They do what? No, no, they don't create hybrids. They're, they're, they're secreting cytokines, which are involved in maintaining and fostering the tumor cells in the primary organ or generating cancer stem cells from the more differentiated tumor cells. I don't know if people have looked at, at, at cell fusion as a potential mechanism. I think, I don't know if it's fusion per se or diffusible factors or cell-cell contact. I don't know of any studies that has looked at, you know, heterocarion fusion. Nuclear fusion, I don't know. But let me tell you, one, a colleague of mine, what he's done. He's taken human breast cancer cells or mouse tumor cells, and he's taken a, uh, and mixed those cancer stem cells with normal mouse mammary epithelial cells, okay? And what he's done is gone back into a cleared fat pad, and he's labeled those tumor cells, genetically labeled them. All of those tumor cells now convert to a normal mammary gland, irregardless as to whether they're a mouse or a human. What does that say? There's something in the niche that's able to reprogram across species tumor cells. What are those factors? What are those cells that are interacting with the tumor cells? Are they resonant cells within the mammary gland? Are they lymphoid invading cells? Are they stromal cells that are there in the, in the fat pad? Are they adipocytes? Or is it a collection of characters? Yes. It'll keep people busy for a long time. <laughs> but. It offers the potential of new therapeutic targets, okay? Out of the box. What? Ah, therein lies the rub, as Shakespeare said. Now you've got to find a way of selectively killing the tumor stem cells without obliterating the normal stem cells from the organ from which the tumor arises. So that's going to be a very delicate process of, of defining what factors are expressed in the tumor niche versus the normal niche. And how does the tumor stem cell differ genetically or by transcriptome analysis or whatever from the normal stem cell? It's a, it's a, it's a dialogue here that's going on. Cancers. Uh, Basically, an aberrant dialogue. It's, it's an antisocial disease. These cell types are talking together in the wrong way, and it could be disastrous, and that's what cancer is here. But it, it's going to be tough. <laughs> well, 